Hi, welcome to Haven. This is a podcast that's a safe space for curiosity and conversation. Welcome to season two, by the way. I don't know if you're watching this or if you're listening on audio, but if you see it, I am in a new location. I'm filming from my home on the couch because I make up the rules. I get to decide where to film. I get to decide that it's season two out of nowhere, just because. So trying new things, different spots, different ideas. The next couple episodes will actually be a part of a relationship series. So whether that's spouses, parents, kids, exes, best friends, a little bit of all of it mixed together. But today, I'm curious about what my mother taught me. What my mother taught me, or more aptly and tongue-in-cheek named, the facts of life and what my mother taught me. Because if you're under 40, you may not know the show, The Facts of Life, but it was very popular in the 80s. And my mother, Lisa Welchel, played Blair, Blair Warner. And she taught me a lot of things outside of even just who she is as an actress, obviously, but I wanna at least start off, welcome mom. It's so good to be here. This is really, really fun. Not only are, are, are the roles reversed because you're, you know, you're on the lights and the camera and that's not anything you were ever interested in doing, but I also love it because I've been listening and watching your podcast and I've been learning from you and I just love the role reversal. Thank you, mom. You know, the, even the idea of having you on here is because I did that episode um, about blind spots and you had written me this really thoughtful, intentional email talking about it for me. And I put a clip online and it garnered like a million views and everyone was commenting like what a healthy mother what's that like or like can you have your mom on like <laughs> what is it like to enjoy her and to want feedback and they had no clue who you were like I'm sure most of my listeners have like didn't know prior or if they did now it's like oh awesome cool <laughs> yeah. who's that I'm gonna have to check that out on YouTube <laughs> that's not true my <laughs> list YouTube is too old now too Maybe I it's... guarantee my LinkedIn followers okay, will probably be go. excited about this one <laughs> <laughs> but no, like people were truly like, can you have your mom on? Can you have your mom on? And because sure, acting's glitz and glamour and your whole life. But like to me, your mom, like you're my mom and you are the best mom. <laughs> and we can fill in your viewers because uh, I walked in. She says, wow, mom, <laughs> when you wash your hair and put makeup on, you look really great. So. Yes, I was like, my breath was taken away. And I was like, wow, when you put in effort, like. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty substantial. Like, I always think you're beautiful, but like... I don't put in the you effort. You never put in effort. No, no, no. No, I was the opposite of Blair. Yeah. But I like that, though, because it's like a little in your back pocket. It you is. Know? Is. If I yeah. need it for something special like my daughter's podcast, yeah. it's Yeah, under promise, over deliver. There you go. Yeah, I like it on there. <laughs> but I'm so glad you're here because what I want to talk about is not only to the mother-child, but like it evolves what it is like in toddlerhood is different than in preteen, than in high school and adult. And so I'm now doing weekly mini episodes, so a little shorter, but I had already read all, written all the content for this one to be a longer one. So we're going to make it in two parts. This first part is going to talk about the mother child dynamic up until high school. And then the second part is going to be like high school adult college because they're very different tracks and you were a very different mother yeah yeah not only do the children change and grow and evolve so inherently the relationship needs to grow and change and evolve but hopefully the mother is also growing and changing and evolving and so that really you don't want to look back on your relationship with your child and either one of you to have stayed the same because that means one of you is not growing hmm. but Growing means you're becoming something new. And anything new, there's an element of mystery and fear involved. So I do think that, you know, unless you're feeling a little bit of fear, then you, you're you maybe not growing. Isn't she so well-spoken, guys? <laughs> like, how beautiful is that? You Thank just you, made darling. that up off the cuff of just nowhere. She doesn't know anything we're talking about today. Like, I gave her a little, like, oh. We I know, know a little bit her. about you. You know about me. <laughs> but I showed her like a little notes, but it's going to be a fun surprise. And the good thing is, is that I, as we joked about earlier, 
I have the worst memory. And I know in one of your episodes where you mentioned that you have a bad memory too, mm -hmm. but Clancy, we really need Clancy in here yeah. for, you know, you know, the, that part where you have to just check everything through the, the legal or oh, like the fact checker. That's right. The fact yeah. checker. We need Clancy here for a fact checker. Otherwise we can just make it up. Yeah. And I think we'd be like, that's close enough. Yeah. I think that happened. I yeah, think that, that happened. That's what I remember. Sure. <laughs> so true. We're not really reliable narrators. No. Okay, I want to start out with, like, childhood, young, young childhood. You, as a mom well, for young... Well, I was young... born and raised in Texas. <laughs> okay. Oh, not that young, Read not my childhood. biography <laughs> if you want to know about her. I'm talking about... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is all about you. This is called Buffer. Haven. The facts of life are all about you. Oh, clever. Call back to her theme song, everyone. <laughs> okay, for real, though. Okay. <laughs> childhood. You were a different parent mm -hmm. to us as little kids. Yeah. Like, we looked in the baby boxes. One... There are 17 baby boxes for each of us as children, and they are all very special to us. But you, like, stored it. You scrapped booked. Like, you have so much documented. But we looked at one of our day sheets of, like, what we did each day, and you had broken it out every 15 minutes. And it was three columns, like a Tucker Haven Clancy. Four, actually, and mom. Oh. So it was an Excel spreadsheet. Um I had three children within three years, so that means I had three babies in diapers, uh, three toddlers, three elementary, three junior high, three high school, three college, I mean, three weddings. I mean, it's yeah. all back, 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 back. So I had to be uber, uber organized. So organized. AKA controlling. Yeah, I mean, it worked. <laughs> I felt very safe as a kid. Um, but it would literally, but it was, it was so interesting because the breakdowns, it would be like Haven reading time. And it, you would let us go find a reading space. So I'd like go under the piano to read. Then it was like, Tucker, 15 minutes, go shoot basketballs outside. Clancy, 15 minutes, one-on-one -on -one with mom. Or like, it, was, it wasn't just go do this, you know. And then it was boring stuff. You put really awesome stuff throughout the day. Or it was like, we're going to go to a museum, you know, and do some science experiments. Like, how did you choose how to structure the day? Well, I started with what I wanted each of you to internalize. And experiences that I wanted you to have. And then, I mean, it's it, it, not unlike how I've written books. What is it I want to say? Okay, which of these kind of clump together and fit together? And then what's the heading for each of those? And so that's what I did with you as a kid. You know, kids, I wanted you to learn how to just to be able to pick up a book and read a book. And that to know that that can take you into another world. And that's fun and that's enjoyable. It's not something that you, you have to do. It's something you get to do. I wanted you to have lots of, you know, arts and crafts and creative times. So Barney was big back then. So you had the Barney box, which was really just a scrap of all kinds of things to create from. I wanted you to be outside in nature. So there would be the outside time. I wanted you to learn how to be able to play by yourself. And so each of you had alone time where there was n nothing. You just go in your room and you don't come out to the timer rings and you figure out what to do. So it was really just all these kinds of, of either character things I wanted to build in you or experiences I wanted you to have. And I did want to make sure that I had one-on-one -on -one time with each of you since you were so close in age. And then I just put it on a spreadsheet. I love that. So tell us even, too, because you were a bit of a different parent to each child in that we had different unique needs. Like there were some that translated over but the way that you even kind of would talk to us was different where you would say like the different color schemes for each child and I remember kind of internalizing that of like oh like this is uniquely me like can you talk a little bit about how you selected those yeah because you were so close in age um people would oftentimes kind of lump you together but then they would say well you know are they like are they different and so I would rather than I didn't really want to label you oh you know He's the this one, she's the that one. So I said, it's if you think of it in terms more of color, they each embody color groups. And so Tucker, who just all boy, ADD, what you see is what you get. He's like your basic primary, you know, eight pack of crayons, fire engine red, full of life green, just sunshiny yellow, um, but not so complicated that he's the 64 pack with the sharpener built in. You know? <laughs> no, he's very what you see, what you get. Absolutely. Um, Haven, and I, and I came up with these all when you were guys were under the age of four or five because personalities really do show up very, very early on, as any mom or dad can tell you. 
Uh, Haven was more the jewel tones. So just midnight blue, scarlet, burgundy red, just deep, rich gold, a really deep, beautiful, complicated, mysterious, inviting colors that you know you go into those colors there's just a treasure chest a mine there are gems somewhere hidden in this dark cave and then at first Clancy we thought of um pastels because she's always been you know very sweet compliant people pleaser but she does have every once in a while a lot of sparkle will mm -hmm. come out so fluorescent seemed perfect for her you know razzle dazzle raspberry you know um lime green um absolutely sparkling hot pink with glitter inside mm -hmm. so those were the color schemes for each of my children and i felt that that was a good expression of their essence without boxing them in to certain labels i love you mom i love you sweetheart how could i not feel loved hearing your mom describe you that way you know like that to me is just I, we you and i went to lunch like a couple weeks ago and i was kind of talking to you of like aaron's amazing my kids are amazing i have so many close relationships but when i look back like i really do feel like you're the love of my life wow mm -hmm. that's really that's just really powerful and heavy <laughs> No pressure. <laughs> no pressure. On that. You're my best friend. Am I your best friend? <laughs> it's but so I beautiful. Mean it though. Thank like you, you darling. just you I can't say that you're the love of my life because your siblings watch oh, you're, this podcast. You're on my siblings' podcast right now? Because this is called Haven. I think you can. I think you can say it. No, it's fine, it's fine, whatever. And you're married, whatever. And you know, your heart just expands with every love. Okay, well. Just like your belly does. Yes, like your And that includes marriage. And that includes marriage. <laughs> That's so true. No, I stand by you're the love of my life. Thank you, baby. I love you so, so much. And it also, the childhood thing of like the unique time, especially with three kids back to back, there was a thing that you instilled at night where you called it window time. And it was, you would come sit on our beds, tell us like, how'd you come up with it? And what did you ask? And why did you do that? Because life was very busy with three children so close together and much of the time just to get through, I needed to kind of, yes, you had these 15 minute increments, but we went places together and did things together. And even when we were individual, somebody was from the other room wanting something. So I really wanted to make sure that I had one-on-one -on -one time with each of you. And so I discovered as many, uh, as many moms do that the nighttime is when the kids are stalling. They don't want to go to bed. <laughs> and so I decided, well, I will take advantage of that. And I implemented window time. And so after baths and teeth brushing and pajamas, each child was able to, to lay in their bed and read a book, even if that meant just looking at the pictures, while I spent at least 15 minutes when you were little, longer as you got older, with each child. And I would just sit on your bed. And I called it window time because it really was the the most possibility for the window of your soul because you were the the day was done you were rested you were open you didn't want to go to sleep and you were looking forward to this time and because it was every night you knew that you could count on having one-on-one -on -one time with me every night so oftentimes you would save up something that you wanted to talk to me about if it was exciting and you didn't want the your siblings in the middle of it or if it was something that was a little scary or confusing you knew there would be a time then you could share it with me so i would ask i would ask you um you know what was your high of the day what was your low of the day was there any questions that came up that you wanted to ask anything you were confused about was there anything you wanted to confess uh, because you knew that if you confessed it, especially at, w at window time, and I wanted to teach you that confession felt good and it's actually better because you knew that I wasn't going to punish you. I was going to celebrate your confession. And it was another way of just kind of staying clean mm -hmm. from the day. I love it. And going back to memory, Clancy, the one of our family who has the best memory, one time was telling us that she saved up one thing she wanted to confess at window time. And she was so embarrassed. She put like her sheet over her head and she was like, Mom, I blew Andrew a kiss today. <laughs> <laughs> and when you were talking to her about it, you were like, 
oh, well, I don't know if you need to confess about that. You know, tell me about it. And it broke down and he was across the soccer field, not even looking at her. And then she just goes like this. (laughs) (laughs) A little side kiss. A little side kiss that she just she blew it and like she felt so bad so now Aaron and I will look at each other and go hey <laughs> <laughs> and blow like a kiss across oh. the room but sweet Clancy sweet she carried Clancy. a lot of she did she still carries a lot of a lot. Catholic guilt and we weren't Catholic <laughs> we weren't no I don't know where that came from now a quick pause to hear from my sponsors this episode is brought to you by Aid. Efficient offers fractional virtual assistants whose sole purpose is to help people who are making a difference. Are you bogged down in your email and still managing your own calendar? Delegating those tasks to a high caliber career assistant can free you up to utilize your time towards the areas of your best and highest use, allowing you to focus on the areas you truly thrive in. Learn more at efficientaid.com. That's efficient, A-I-D-E.com. Okay. Back to the episode. But I love that. Makes me want to instill it with my kids. I feel so bad. I'm like, oh, I should probably do that. You do so much with your kids. I really admire the way you parent. I've learned a lot. And I've, you know, I've really had to negotiate my own relationship with regret by watching Mm -hmm. you as a parent and realize, you know, the, the truth is, let me just say to any parents out there, young or old, you will do it wrong. It, you will be proven wrong. You will be proven wrong all the way. Whether you are, you know, safe and structured, then you were not express. They were not allowed to express their feelings enough. If they allow their express their feelings, then you weren't, you know, structured enough. So there is no doing this this right. And thankfully. There's so much more available now. I mean, what you, who you follow on Instagram and TikTok and the things you learn. I mean, we had books and everything, but there's so much wisdom and so much just awareness and intention around parenting. And had I had that, I think I would have loved it and I would have implemented those things. I didn't, and I regret that I didn't have it available, but I do have to be careful not to beat myself up for, you know, the mistakes that I made and the the regrets that I had. We're all doing the best we can. I completely believe you're doing the best you could. That said, what's a regret you have? Oh my gosh. Well, I, um... You know, I guess we can decide whether we leave this in or not, but I'm going to be honest. Um, When I think about what were we thinking with the whole spanking thing, the truth is, is I actually, I want to be honest about the fact that we can all, especially as a culture, we can be blinded because everyone else is doing it or the authorities are saying it, the the authorities in our lives are saying it. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is not just in the last few generations. In generations and generations, the culture says this is acceptable. And then later on, you look back and you go, wow, how blind was I to think that that was okay? Mm -hmm. How blind was I to think that it was okay to spank my children? Mm -hmm. And yet, not only was it considered okay, it was considered good parenting. And I think that's a, it's a lesson for all of us. Mm -hmm. I do, because I think there's no telling what we're all doing today because everybody says this is the right and the good and the best thing to do. And we're going to look back you know, maybe 20, 50 years down the road, and we're going to go, my goodness, where was my head? What was Mm -hmm. I thinking? Well, we probably weren't thinking to Mm -hmm. some degree. We were just kind of going along with those that we trusted and everybody around us was doing it. That doesn't make it right, but it also doesn't mean that it also doesn't mean that we should, you know, beat up on ourselves because I think we need to hold both of those truths. We are doing the best we can and hopefully we learn. And when we learn, we look back and we think, oh, wow, I wouldn't do that anymore. It's so interesting you say that because even in this um, previous episode, we we're talking about parenting and like just the things where I'm sure my kids will come and say, mom, we don't do that anymore. And like, here's why. But it's like um, past generations spanked. You know, I, again, I choose not to for all of those reasons of like, I don't. You could. I'm glad you don't because I would spank you if you spanked my <laughs> grandchildren. Yeah, I'm sure that's in our baby box somewhere, whatever little thing you spanked us with. But like, um, I don't want to teach my children, hey, it's never okay to hit. But then I'm 
upset with them and I, you know, hit them. That to me is a little bizarre, but it is having to be held with so much grace because previous generations spanked. The ones after that would send to time out because they thought that's better than spanking a child is, okay, go and think about what you did, have time, you know, in your head to calm down. And then my generation, even to that one is like, oh, you're sending us away into the corner until we have more approved emotions. You know, you're isolating us unless we're giving you an appropriately deemed behavior, but you're going to slice off connection, you know, like 100% because I don't think there's anything more painful than feeling rejected by your parent or not good enough to be in the same room or to be or separation is at the core of the deepest grief and suffering there is in any situation Mm -hmm. so to to separate your child from you because they did something wrong or Mm -hmm. bad yeah we would have thought oh yeah that's so much better than spanking and it makes sense and all that and i'm not beating anybody else uh, up on it because i i did the same thing but now once we know better as maya angelou says we do better yeah and that is not an an emotionally that's emotional spanking to Mm -hmm. a child to be sent away because they've done something that is undeserving of connection and staying connected through discipline at least right now, mm-hmm. feels like just the, the best way to handle things. But who knows, 20, 30 years ag- uh, from now, we'll learn more and realize, no, that's not the right I'll way. be sitting on Isley's podcast saying, well, I did it this way and it was wrong. <laughs> it was culturally what everyone said I should do. No, probably though. Um, I want to go into now preteen and puberty. I love the change in the voice. The change too. in tone. Oh, <laughs> I want to go into preteen <laughs> go into and puberty. The dark years. Oh, okay. No, not dark. I just remember you <laughs> proactively telling me you were just like, I don't know, I was probably eight or nine. You're like, hey, in a couple years, by the way, there's going to be something called puberty and you may not recognize yourself. Everything may feel weird. Just want to give you a heads up. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> no, that was actually, this is the whole memory thing. Each of you, when you turned 10 years old, we had, we took, like, your dad took Tucker and they went on a Oh, no, I'll weekend. never forget that. This was in addition to that. Okay, but we talked about puberty and the facts of life. Oh, man. Uh, when you were 10 years old. That's and a little, your 10-year-old trip, which, again, I'm looking back, you know, this is all exciting. Oh, we're going to special mother-daughter time and we're going to do fun things and Bait what? and switch. Yeah, another way you that did that three I, times. Okay, I will be doing that differently too. I know you will. Of course you will. Please do. Okay, I'll explain how you did it, and then I'll explain just the gleaning the wisdom and then going a different route. So what you guys did was pretty weird. <laughs> and I get it in theory where you go. Okay, when you're ten, you choose a special location. Like Tucker, did he do Legoland or something? I or think so. You get to go somewhere special, and then we just have like a big ten year old talk or whatever. No clue what that meant. And then Tucker came back and he was like, yeah, it was fun until they took me to dinner and talked to me. And I was like, what? (laughs) Then my birthday came. And then when we were going, Tucker was like, bring a barf bag. And I was like, what? And then you sit me down and you teach me about sex. And I, my first question was, Pastor Jack did that? (laughs) (laughs) I was like, who's the holiest person I know? Like, and they're doing what you're telling me? And I remember being just like, whoa pretty weird and then you know who beat the system though clancy clancy because clancy on she went on the trip she took advantage of the trip and then before you guys started talking to her she goes i don't think my heart's ready for what you're about to tell me and she got to avoid the talk for a while you she guys, did she got another trip she got another trip that's the mm-hmm. way to beat the system man yeah well that's what you learn when you're the baby in the family yeah she she worked the system i wish i had thought of that but <laughs> Again, different generation. I took a workshop, the Birds and the Bees workshop, which is amazing of how to teach your kids about sex. And they're like, don't do one big conversation. Because also at in the 90s, like 10 years old was sufficient. Now kids are going to hear sooner. And it's like you can't hold it up. If you want to be the first one, then you have to do it prior. And it's basically the drip, drip, drip method. Where in toddlerhood, we're talking about seeds and eggs. We're talking about, okay, Isley, did you know when you plant a seed, you know, things grow when you have the environment there? Or look at this egg. Some of them make chickens. Some of them don't. Isn't that interesting? And you lay this whole 
groundwork of a age appropriate conversations leading into sex versus like you've never known about this and now here's level 10 <laughs> so intense i love how this podcast has shifted gears now it's all the things that i did that now we are not doing it that way it's <laughs> true anymore but it's so true and i mean i'm so glad this next generation is reaping the benefit of more self-awareness mm -hmm. and more training and really the the experts that are out there and available yeah. because also the experts that were available at our time you know they were in their own limited perspective that's a great point let's bring it back to the light side we've been on the dark side but if anyone listens to the way you talk about us like there was such a foundation of love i feel like even this like i don't know how many grown women can say hey i don't love it when you did this when you were parenting and then to be received in an open dialogue, you know, like even that to me is huge where you're receptive to be like, there may be a better way. Like I did the best I could. And like that to me is such a testament to even the relationship as it grows, because at the time growing up, that structure felt safe, that maybe intense like time schedule. I loved, I knew what was coming. I knew where the boundaries were. I knew when I could talk to you at night. Like I felt very in the know, but I think the danger people can run into though is not evolving the relationship as it grows up. So like even in puberty though, my childhood experience was you gave us more room to play. You gave us more autonomy and more independence and let us kind of figure things out too where I think some of the pitfalls of parents is the mother being like, okay, this schedule worked for kids. Let's make this schedule work for preteens. And I don't know if it always does. I don't think it really ultimately ever does because it's so tempting. If you've been able to have some control over your children when they're little because you want to you want to keep them safe. And so you want to be able to say, you know, don't do this and they not do, do it because you know that if they go against that, they're going to be hurt. So you, you know, you want to be able to control their environment. And it's even, it's really tempting to continue that, maybe even have even more control, the more autonomy they have because they're in junior high and high school. And even back when you were little, there were a lot of dangers. Now, even more so things that, that it, you know, children at, 12, 13, and 14 really do not have the capacity to, to make the best decisions given the amount of freedom that's available in this day and age and the dangers that are out there. So, of course, every parent's going to want to control even more, but that, unfortunately, it just isn't, it doesn't work, for mm -hmm. one thing. Yeah, when I was thinking about the kids that I knew that, like, if they had really controlling parents in junior high— they would do one of three things, typically. They would either conform to their parents and have no idea their own identity when they became an adult. That would be me. Yeah, mm -hmm. like they would conform and then do everything their parents said, and then when they were off on their own, they felt really clueless. Or I knew the kids that would rebel and just be explosive for junior high, high school, just, just so intense with their parents. Or I knew kids who would hide everything. And maybe they looked like they were conforming. No one knew they were rebelling, but really they were lying to everyone around them. And that's the danger of being so controlling when your kid needs that autonomy and freedom. And I'm glad you used the word danger because that's the danger. And that is the danger because you don't want your children ultimately to be people pleasers or just against and rebel uh, out of everything or to be hiding and feel with either shame or, or just deception, even mm -hmm. self-deception. So there's going to be danger. Probably the better idea is to err on the side of danger of letting life teach the lessons mm -hmm. to the children. Now, obviously within limits. I mean, there's all obviously where parents, you know, whether they're five, 14 or eight or 17 or whatever. Um, so you still want to protect them as much as you can, but also you want them to be able to learn lessons from life because that's going to be the most impactful and they're not going to rebel against that or just do it because you say ultimately they're going to have to learn just the lessons of life. And this way you can, can you can keep the relationship mm -hmm. because each of those scenarios that you just um, pointed out, there is 
disconnection. If you're a people pleaser uh, as a child, then the child is disconnecting from themselves in order to stay connected to you. But that's not true connection. If they are rebelling, then they are just hatcheting the cord and there's no connection between parent and child. And if there's hiding, it's connect, it's disconnecting from the parent and themselves mm. both. So the goal is to stay connected with your children at all age and be able to go through lives and ha their lives with an open, um, kind of an open book policy. Maybe make the deal, and we talked about this. If you come and confess something to us, mm -hmm. there's not going to be retribution because this is life, and you're open to us working through this together. And I think that's a deeper value to teach your children because they're all going to make mistakes. We're all going to do things wrong. And then on top of that, it teaches grace. Mm -hmm. And I think that the only way that you can no grace is to actually need grace. And I think a lot of, especially in the faith community, we, we want to talk about grace, but we're not really very good at living out giving grace or much better about living out judgment. Um, but grace is really where true growth happens anyway. So they're going to grow and evolve as children in a climate of love and grace, much more than judgment and punishment. I think it's so, so true on all of that, because also if they're making those mistakes and feel comfortable talking to you about it, like you then get input and in helping them um, become the internal voice of how to handle problems, where if they don't come to you, then they're just going to be handling it with their immature brains not really knowing what to do it or if they're adults off on their own those problems are going to be so much bigger and they're not going to have the skills or the tools for how to handle the problems when they actually can knock them over and uh children especially as they they get older there's just this natural as they're individuating wanting to be against the parent so it's very natural if a parent says the sky is blue for them to say, well, technically, it's actually that's a reflection of the ocean. It's not like, OK, yeah, OK, you're right. Mm -hmm. So when you guys were kind of growing up and I remember there was you were there was certain music that Tucker wanted to listen to um, as he got older. And, you know, marijuana was part of the equation in the question um, rather than just say, no, that's not good for your body or not good for your mind or not good for your eyes, what they, you know, you guys wanted to watch, I would say, well, tell you what, come to, come to me with your reasoning behind why you want to watch this, why you want to do this, why you want to see that. And oftentimes when you had to actually take a moment for all of us now, mind, it's basically mindfulness, mm -hmm. not just on autopilot being driven by your, your senses uh, and, and your drives, but to pause and reflect and think, and you would bring it to me with your argument or your, you know, your reasoning behind it, and on your own come to the conclusion, you know, actually that's really not congruent with my values, or that's actually not, probably not best for me, or you, or even if you had to just save face and, and say something, and it, but then you had had time to think about it and maybe even kind of experiment with it a little bit, but then realize you ultimately, that's not something you wanted anyway, but at least you had the independence and the autonomy to be able to make an informed decision based on what you had thought through rather than what we just told you, you can do it or not do it. That's so, I feel like that's kind of revolutionary for parents. So I feel like parents kind of have the mindset of like, this is right this is wrong, go in this. Uh, and I want to just, you know, speak up for parents here. Um, it's all based on love and our mm -hmm. own fear. Most parent, most of all of us as individuals, and certainly in the area of parenting, it's so easy to parent out of fear. And I'm so afraid that they're going to get in trouble or they're going to get in a bad relationship or they're going to something bad's going to happen or they're not going to learn this lesson. And so when we parent out of fear, that is when we tend to be over controlling, over protective, imposing our beliefs and not letting our children be who they are. But at the bottom of it, it is love still. I like that a lot because it's also what's scarier than high school, which is the next episode we're going to talk about. So. First, thanks for being on this. Thanks for being on the couch. I like being in my house so much more. No, this is wonderful. I love it too. I just wish the babies were here. I know. They're in school, preschool, so we can film this. But 
Okay, this is the part one of the episode I'm doing with my mother. We talked childhood up to preteen, junior high. The next episode is going to be high school through adulthood. So tune in. My episodes for this season, at least, are going to be weekly now, shorter weekly. So it's going to be more frequent, a little more jam-packed content. So I'm glad you're part of the journey. I also have something new for season two, which is a monthly newsletter. You can sign up for it by going to havenpod.com and just put your information there and you'll get little surprises each month into your inbox to look forward to. And then my other request, besides the follow, like, subscribe on YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok is share this podcast. It would mean so much to me if something impacted you and you shared it with a friend and then you guys could talk about it together. Um, I'd like for the reach to expand. I'm pretty shameless about that. I'd like for this to grow. I think these are interesting topics. I want to have a community of people who are intrigued to pull the thread of where we're curious and so I want it to grow I can't do it by myself I can't do it at all without you so I hope that you would share it with friends um, and other people in your life so thank you so much and stay tuned for part two next week sharing is caring okay (laughs) 